Sandra Bendisholi from the Science Policy Program of EMBO, and I'm talking to Tim Caulfield, uh, expert in health law and science policy, and professor at the University of Alberta in Canada. And so thank you, Tim, for talking to us today. Oh, my pleasure. So Tim, um, you have studied this um, application of genomics, uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing services, extensively. So could you start telling us what they are and what they offer? Uh, so these are companies, and they exist all over the world, that offer a range of genetic testing services. So there you can get genetic testing for everything from uh, uh, athletic ability, to allegedly genetically te uh, tailoring your cosmetics and allegedly genetically picking even your mate. But all of those, those kind of clinics are, and those kind of services I think are quite questionable and, and you can go so far as to say bogus. The ones I think that have attracted the most attention are the ones that are, have a little more legitimacy and actually a lot more legitimacy around them. And those are, are, are companies that will test your genes We'll say that roughly, what they're actually testing, uh, you know, the, uh, SNPs and other, a variety of other kinds of ways of, of determining your genetic predispositions. But what they're really testing is to find out uh, your genetic predispositions to a whole range of things, primarily for the purposes of health. And you, for now a reasonable amount of money, just send in some spit, and I've done it. Uh, you send in a, a sample, and they, uh, you have to fill up a little thing of spit, and you send it in. And they will give you uh, uh, your predisposition to just a whole bunch of different things. And, and it's quite sophisticated when you look at it. So you get basically, you, you will get an email saying your results are ready. You click on, on the, uh, uh, the link and boom, you find out all your, these amazing genetic uh, predispositions. But how easy it is for a normal person to understand the meaning of what you receive from them? Well, you know, this is a very good, a good point. You know, I mean, in general, humans are really bad at all humans, whether they're, you know, a physician or a scientist or the uh, person on the street. Uh, they're really bad at understanding probability and understanding risk, right? So when you find out that you are, 23andMe tells me that I'm at increased risk for celiac disease. I don't have celiac disease, but they say I'm at increased risk for it, or at increased risk for MS or a particular kind of cancer. That sounds scary, right? That sounds scary. But then when you find out you're going from, for example, a 0.1% a chance of getting this disease to a 0.2% chance of getting this disease based on your genes, that's, that's actually, you know, a 100% increase in risk. But it doesn't mean anything? No. No. And that is why I'm such a skeptic of this whole area. Um, in general, despite all the hype, despite what everyone hears about, uh, about genetics, most genetic information is not very predictive. You know, it really isn't. So how do people react to this information? Do they get anxious generally? Yeah. You have studied people's attitudes and people's yeah. reactions. So I've been following the whole genetic revolution <laughs> really since it started in, uh, let's say, the, around the start of the Human Genome Project in the early 1990s. That's actually when I started kind of my career, so it's been following it all along. And this idea that you raise that people are going to freak out or people are going to get very anxious about the genetic information has, has been around from the start, right? Well, it's fascinating because recent research has shown, and, uh, shown us that people don't freak out. And there's been a, quite a few studies on this now. They really don't freak out. People, uh, they sometimes, for some of the more severe ones, they do get anxious for a short amount of time, but it dissipates, right? And, and given the low predictive value of most of this information, that's a pretty r rational response, actually. You know, they shouldn't be freaking out. And also on the validity of this, um, right. this information. I mean, I've read about people taking tests from different companies and getting yes, different right. results. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, that, that's a great point. And actually, in preparation for my talk, <laughs> I, I was going to dig around and see if there's an update on that. because. Um, for sure, uh, the, even the major companies, there's questions around validity, right? A and uh, there have been a number of studies that have found that you get to absolutely, completely different results. Now, I think the companies are more sensitive to that and they're trying to work it out, and that's why I wanted to see if there's more recent data. But until I see that more recent data, you're absolutely right. There, it's even questionable, even with these very sophisticated companies, whether you're always going to get the same result, which, of course, you know, when you, don't have that, when you have that poor kind of reliability, people may not be interested in the test. And um, for instance, in Germany, these comp private companies are not allowed 
-hmm. So how are these companies regulated in different countries? It seems like it's completely different so, in every place. Now, it's interesting because you know, here I am, I'm a skeptic saying, you know, you don't have to worry about the, you know, I'm a skeptic of the companies, it's not that valuable. But I'm also, I think I'm rare in our community and I don't think it's like the information is that big of a deal. I don't think it needs that much regulating for the exact same reason, right? You know, I, I don't think the information is that powerful. People don't freak out. So I, I don't know how, to what degree that this, this industry needs to be carefully regulated. For sure, I think we need to have truth in advertising. We have to make sure the claims are, are accurate and they're not overstated. But people are freaking out. And I'm, I'm even a skeptic in the area of genetic uh, discrimination. Like, I don't know how much of that's happening. Uh, I think that, that was, that's one of those topics that has been around since the start. One of the first ones, and it just seems like, oh, we got to be freaked out about genetic discrimination, even though the data about how often it happens is not very good. I mean, look, if you believe the research, it doesn't happen very often. And uh, so do we really need this whole new regulatory regime to, to handle this? I don't think so. But the data issue, though, I mean, how these companies store yeah. the genetic information of, of their clients and how they share it, how they use it to apply for patents. There are a lot of issues. Which this is a big issue. I <laughs> think, yeah, I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is, is one of the more, yeah, this is definitely one of the more problematic areas. Um, you know, one of my colleagues of mine looked into all the privacy rules around these companies and found that, you know, huge variability, a lack of clarity. In addition to that, what if one of the companies goes under, right? What happens to all that information? There's fast, these fascinating issues on bankruptcy, bankruptcy and, and how, how do you, who, what happens to the information in that kind of situation, or even if the company changes hands, right? Let's say one company owns, you know, who knows, right? So these are all fascinating issues that need to be addressed. Sure. And your, your talk will be also on the benefits of yeah. these services for public health. So what are the benefits? I don't know if there are. <laughs> I will say this. I will say this. It's it's fun. Like I, you know, I'm not one of those people that say, oh, don't waste your money on it. You know, these are terrible, evil companies. I don't think that at all. It's kind of fun to find out this information. I found out my ancestry information too, and it's it's relatively benign. Now, having said that, there are, there are a, a couple genes, you know, there that are, can be quite um, predictive, and they're quite sensitive. Now, but I did not look at my Alzheimer predisposition information. And you're not the only one who yeah, I know. It, <laughs> it seems to be a common response. I think there are, you know, I'm making these big sweeping statements, but there are kind of, you know, these these few genes and you know, the monogenetic diseases, et cetera, that, that I think are, are relevant. But those are relatively rare. When you look at uh, most of these companies are really aimed at chronic diseases, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. You know, really aimed at chronic diseases more than anything, and that's where I don't think they're very valuable. Uh, so what about the ancestry um, genetic testing? So it's funny because I found out I am 100% Irish, like 100% Irish. I don't have some, uh, it's funny because when I, I didn't, didn't know. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Um, uh, we, I mean, that's fascinating. Also, I mean, people need to understand what's going going into it, but that's gotten quite sophisticated. And given what's available, the information is available. So that's again, it's kind of fun. So I don't think people need to necessarily fear it. My, I guess I don't want to call it a complaint, but my biggest criticism is I just think the value is is minimal in a health context. And I'm not the, I'm not the only one that says that, and I'll talk about it today. There are a lot of studies that have shown that that's the case. Um, look, one of the reasons that people do this, and I'll talk about this today, is and one of the one of the marketing points of these direct to consumer companies is about empowerment. Right? And it's this idea that you know, if you had your genetic information, you're going to start working out and you're going to start eating more fruits and vegetables and you're going to stop smoking. You know, you know what? You should do that anyway. You don't need genetic testing to tell you that. right? And, and in fact, as I said before, you can, it's hard to come up with, other than the, the highly penetrant cancer genes, and as you know, there aren't many, other than the monogenetic dis diseases, and again, those are relatively rare in a population level, other than the, the, those two categories, it's difficult to come up with a, a gene that is as predictive for future health issues as the weigh scale or the blood pressure cuff. In, in fact, I don't think there is. Right? And people don't change their behavior based on that. Right? They look down, they see a number on the scale, and they don't change their behavior. Right? They get their blood pressure count, they don't change their behavior. So why would we think that 
getting this genetic information is going to cause people to change their behavior. And research tells us that people don't change their behavior, right? And it's very, very difficult to create behavior change. I mean, look, we have a huge obesity problem. We have a smoking problem. We have a lack of exercise problem. It's very difficult to get people to change their behavior. Okay, so that's all. Thanks a lot, Tim, again, for taking time for us. And I'm looking forward to your talk. Oh, it was my pleasure. It was fun. Thank <laughs> you.